this is this is accomplishing uh, what I what I hoped it would is a kickoff to let's change some things let's stir some things up and let's let's do something different let's <clears throat> let's grow if you're going to grow if you have a vision We have a vision out here. It's what you need to be looking at all the time. What is your vision? Without a vision, Proverbs 29, what? People the people perish. Or they're, they're unrestrained. They'll go do anything. And so, there's levels. There's levels to your vision. It doesn't matter where you are, if we're way up here or we're way down here. The process remains the same. It is to go after the vision. Right? If you're going to change, the fastest, the quickest... The most effective way I've found to change is to face reality. It's not just what we think reality is, but to actually face reality. How are things actually? What is real? <clears throat> Some people have been known to embellish how maybe poor things are, so then we can make excuses as to why we're not where we ought to be or what we think we ought to be or... We give God these excuses. But if you really face reality, you can change. Is that a question or are you waving at me? What? I just love the outfit. What do you What do you mean? There, how's that? <laughs> We're better. Yeah. All right. So, does that that helps, right? Now you can not. All right. <laughs> so we're we're we we need to face reality how how things actually are not worse than they are and as we go along we're going to have these key transition points that determine if we're going to go to the next level or if we're going to fall off success succession revelation I don't know anyone that's had a slow revelation have you Usually, revelation happens, it happens fairly fast. Mm -hmm. But it's not the first time you heard it that revelation strikes. So, <clears throat> if you were going to, we ain't going to use him. I had, one of the, I had one of the Sharpies up here a while ago. <laughs> that would have been bad. So, here we are. Here's time, right? And let's just say 
100 is we're we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do everything's like cooking everything's great okay and here's time we know about seed and harvest. harvest and i have to look at one of my notes because i put it very well maybe i'll hit some of this first <clears throat> is that the church chronically underachieves because we try to accomplish god's vision without his resources So the church chronically underachieves because we try to accomplish his vision without his resources. My wife put it this way, is that the church overpromises and underdelivers. We are to train people to become leader servants, then servant leaders. We teach by experience, Solving real life problems. Fulfilling God's plan. Yes. And next time I do this, I'll have slides. <laughs> we teach by experience solving real life problems. Fulfilling God's plan and vision for our lives and those he's entrusted to us. If people aren't challenged in ministry, if they're not challenged by what we're doing, they're going to go look for a challenge someplace else. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're, if we're going to create leaders and leader servants, we need to do that. You know, the, um, always partnering with people to accomplish his vision. Always partnering with people to accomplish his vision. And so many of you know the the illustration of the orchestra leader, I'm not going to go into that, maybe another day. But it is to value, I really, you know, out of uh, what happened this morning, what you had to say impacted me the most. Because you're not going to be the one out there dominating, taking ground, I'm taking territory. You're going to be the one supporting. And if the one out there taking ground taken territory does not listen to you we're going to fight a lot of unnecessary battles and it takes discipline to listen because what you have to say is value and it's important and it makes sure that the leaders don't get the big head Because what you say is equally as valuable. You know, unfortunately, you know, for me, it's, it's taken, taken a long time to be, I've been married 27 years, a long time to be married to the same woman to realize that she's smart. She was stupid when we got together because she picked me. <clears throat> but had I listened to her many things, we would have ended up somewhere else. It would have been better. But I didn't listen. God moves at the speed of relationships. It's not what you can do on your own, but it's what you can do through others. There's a, I think it's called an acronym that spells TEAR. It's torque, efficiency, acceleration, and responsiveness. Torque, efficiency, acceleration, and responsiveness. And someday in the future, this will all be on a slide. <laughs> but torque, leave some space, is how do others grab your direction and run with it? How do others grab your direction and run with it? Can you convey across, can you get across quickly what you mean? Okay, this is what we need done. You got it? Do you understand? Yes. And then they run with it. They run with the vision. How easy is it for others to do that? Self-promotion and, and just ourselves, 
we're really never going to get anywhere. <clears throat> Nobody really cares about your super spiritual message. They don't. Because everybody's got a super spiritual message. And everybody's great. You know? But what they do care about is if you can help them solve an issue or a problem. You know, everybody thinks he is great. Because he has answers that you don't have access to. That develops a rapport. And now he becomes important to your problem. And you're going to listen to what he has to say. Right. For real. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, efficiency is how do others easily turn issues into opportunities? How do others easily turn issues into opportunities? There's always going to be issues. <coughs> it's always going to happen. So who is it in the room that knows how to spot an issue and go, instead of going, oh, it's dark. You know, duh. But who is going to fix it? Who is going to turn that into an opportunity? It's incumbent. It's in, it is... It's on you to do it. It's on you to fix it. If you can see the problem, the same intelligence it takes to see the problem is the same intelligence it takes to solve the problem. Right? How do others achieve plans and goals? Acceleration. How do others achieve plans and goals? Responsiveness. How do others take your vision and make it happen? Stop thinking in terms of how am I going to do this. When we're handed as an issue or a situation, if there's somebody else there, allow them in on it so they can help you. It's it's really uh, it's remarkable. Um, Could you please repeat uh, accept the acceleration and responsiveness, please? Yes. Thank you. How do others achieve plans and goals? And this is what I'm speaking on. Is this is what you've directed? How do others get the plans and goals that you've directed done? And then how do others make your vision happen? You're not going to, ooh, this one kind of cuts. You're not going to get your own vision until you help someone else accomplish their vision. Because you're unqualified. Unless we're partnering with somebody else to get their vision done. Were you going to say something again? Well, I was going to say others have to be able to see themselves in your vision to be a part of that. Isn't that interesting? I think you're right. In Genesis 2.18, it said, it's not good that man be alone. Jesus, we all follow Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at, did, we, did you bring a Bible? Let's look at Luke chapter 10. Like I told you, I'm actually a very serious person. <laughs> when you see enough heartache, it does something to you that allows you to get rid of the minutia or the, uh, the baloney and deal with reality quite quickly. So, Luke chapter 10, verse 1, I'm going to go through 18. <clears throat> After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So what is this? This is his front team. There's the people out preparing the way, right? <clears throat> Verse 2, Then he said to them, 
The harvest is truly great. I don't think that's changed. The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he may send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves, carrying neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the, along the road. But whoever's, but whoever's, or, but whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Verse 7. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you. Heal the sick, Heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, The very, du and say, the very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Verse 12. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable that in that day for Sodom, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom than in that day of that city. Woe to you, and I don't know how to say that word. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the almighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. <clears throat> then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give to you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. He sent them out two by two. They went out and had authority. It is no coincidence to me that he's paired, he has paired Steve and I together. We didn't pair it to get us together. I didn't con him into it. For the longest time, he had no idea. He's like, I don't know why I'm doing this. But this doesn't make sense. We would have conversations. I'm like, I know. It, it doesn't. But let's see. But he knows the Lord's in it. And so we're going to do that. Right? By nothing will any means hurt you. We're protected. You're protected. When we do things together, we protect one another. He watches me and I watch him. You watch out for one another. And Ephesians 4 talks about the fivefold ministry and equipping the saints, which is not a percentage. We are the body of Christ, according to Romans Chapter 12, with the body of Christ, we work together. When one hurts, all hurt. Even God himself works in a team. Mm -hmm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? Yes. What makes you the, the one hit wonder where you think you can do it by yourself? <laughs> that is the work of the enemy. And I think, you know, that may have been, been what, what Steve Castle was saying. It's the, it is the enemy thinking that we handle this ourselves. If you are too prideful to share the load, it's going to eventually catch up to you. Stop doing that. It's easier to submit and, and get on board with someone else. 
it's only through, and this is what I threw in, it's through interdependence and partnership we can fully express our Christian faith. It's through interdependence and partnership we can fully express our Christian faith. Everything God does, He does through relationships. He moves at the speed of relationships. We use His wisdom, methods, procedures that require everyone in the organization to work together, creating depth and competency which delivers greater results. I ain't going anywhere. I mean, we're going to come back. You and I are going to get to know one another, so don't have to get it all at one time. We're going to just be doing this together. Who is your, who is your personal team? Who is your extended team? Who are you partnering with? Who are you working with? Who are you getting results with? Listen, I thought this was interesting. It takes 10,000 hours to develop mastery at something. We don't have enough time to learn everything. I would rather partner with somebody who's really good at it than to try and learn it all myself. A person, and this is something that Dr. Barkley uh, said to Steve and I, is a guy that graduates a two-year Bible school and tries to plan a church really doesn't stand a chance because it's so complicated. You have to be, you have to understand finances. You have to understand business. You have to not be afraid of money. You have to understand people. And really, to expect one guy to do the whole thing I believe it's a reason for our underachievement. Sure. When you have a team of people that do the whole thing, with a leader, everybody achieves more. First mm-hmm. Corinthians twelve twenty eight. <clears throat> And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. The New Living Translation for the word administrations says, those who have the gift of leadership. The Living Bible says those who get others to work together. And the message puts that same one as organizers. These gifts in the body are as valid and needed as apostles, prophets, evangelists, or teachers. Without people working together, we are clanging brass and cymbals. Chang, 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 chang. There's really no one's going to listen. However, what happens is whether we come to Christ at an early age or not or at some point we get born again or at some point we get born again and we're free but along the line we start to pick up stuff that isn't ours I work with a lot of people that have been, been abused and so they will pick up traits and ideas and thoughts that were definitely not their own but were put on them, and we call these generational curses, that were put on them from the people that modeled life to them. And then as you grow up and you mature, you say, well, this must be me. This is who I am. And you're wearing all these things that don't fit. But you'll walk out into public and say, This is me. This is just how I am. And other people will look (laughs) and they'll giggle and they'll say, man, can you believe they did that? Can you believe that? And we're oblivious. And we wonder why things are not working out. 
I mean, if you don't want a job, get a tattoo on your neck. <laughs> I got nothing against tattoos. But if you want something better than a manufacturing job, if you want to run the manufacturing plant, we can't settle for things that are less than us. So let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love chapter. Verse 1, though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass and a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I should move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, That's kind of harsh, isn't it? But have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. Love is kind, does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, Love endures, or endures all things. I had a guy, uh, I asked a guy one time, I said, how, how did I fail? He said, you didn't fail, you just quit. And sometimes if we just pick up where we were, we didn't really fail, but we just stopped. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they'll fail. Where there are tongues, they'll cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And and here it is in verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, but now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. When love is matured, it casts out fear. I believe and I'm right. My kids don't like that, but, but I'm right. We all walk around with these things that are not us. And we try to convince the world that they are us. Because we may have had them for a long time. Because we learned them from somewhere. So, so they're us. But, but they're not. They don't belong to us. You have to face reality to take these things off. Put them away. Do they still exist? Sure they do. You can't tell by looking at him that he spent time in prison. He doesn't lead with that. He doesn't lead with being an inmate. You come and tackle me or what? I got, uh, I'm on it. (laughs) I've done this before. (laughs) Did you say you better watch him? He was up here, he was up here ministered before the the last break. I saw he had his phone in his pocket. (laughs) So I texted him. I said, hi, Steve. (laughs) And he looked at his phone. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so you know it was on vibrate. <laughs> no. Is that all right, Kelsey? Am I all right? <laughs> But put on those things that you actually are. And stop trying to act like everything's fine when, you're, when you look like an idiot. What I mean by that, when it's not you, take it off. Lay aside every weight and sin that besets you. You will never get to the height you want to be staying the same because you're too heavy. <clears throat> okay, what? If, if that, the person that you were before, <laughs> if the person that you were before was who you are, you know, with the earring in your ear, the thing on your head, the, the leather, you know, if that's who you are, I mean, that's just who you are. You know, is it okay to be who you are? Then, if you do this, right, right. You're not being and that's who you are, right. yeah. this is the life. it's just as equally ridiculous. Exactly. Yes, I agree. Does everybody agree or no? Do you, do you agree, Steve, or are you, you like going to check me on that? All right, thanks. It means a lot coming from you. <clears throat> <laughs> it looks like you. <laughs> Is that the you, right? They don't know the story of how you ended up finally owning a sport coat. <laughs> <laughs> he got mad at me. <laughs> no one's so mad. He got mad at me. Okay, I, was mad. <laughs> <laughs> I made him look bad. So. So so let, let's let's uh, let's get back here and we can give Steve some more time. Um, if this is a hundred, where we're rocking out what we're supposed to do, and we're down here, this is what it looks like, and, it, and it's almost it's queer. It's almost like his chart, where you start out like this, and it seems like forever you're just just above ground. And you just go above ground, above ground, above ground. And what some people do is quit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they drop and then stop. But what happens, due season does come. And so at one point, you just take off. And it's almost as if overnight things change. And all of a sudden, it all looks different. And, and the results are different. Except for... You have to <coughs> lay aside the weights that held you at this position. So as you start to take off, so think of the space shuttle. It had the two big rockets on the side, had the great big rocket in the middle. It took the most effort to get the thing off of the ground up into the air. After it got in the air, then those rockets drop off. If those rockets don't drop off, the space shuttle comes back down. If you're, not if you're not willing to let go of those weights and sins that so easily beset you, there's no choice but for you to come back down. So here's the thing. How many times have you heard, I did and I was going so good, but then just when I was about to break through, I went back down to where I was before. Yeah. Well, this is why this happens. There are things that the Holy Spirit is trying to get your attention to to get take that off because that's not going to work. You can't wear an earring. You can't, you know, you can't do those things and live at this level. Right. Now, Bill Winston said, if you're going to go to another level, you got to eat on another level. You have to let those things go. But what happens in here is a lot of experience. <clears throat> and we'll get about this point. We'll say, you know, okay, I've had the experience. I took that trip. I'm ready. God says you're not ready. 
It's really until we're saying, okay, if this is it, this is it. Um, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Let him turn whatever way he wishes. And I enter rest. Then I start handling things differently. They're still coming, still problems, still issues. Nothing looks the same. Still driving the 200,000 mile car. I got one. My car has 200,000 miles on it. But I don't care. I'm accomplishing my mission. I don't, it doesn't matter. When, when the Lord, when I need one, he's got one. I, it, it, it doesn't matter. I don't attach the what matters to I know what matters. The kingdom matters, but also my safety matters. Right? So, <clears throat> in due season, and this is these transition points here on accomplishing your vision. There's always things to let go of. There always is. There was one guy, he was so cute. He's an older guy. He was praying about his relationship with God and the thing that got in the middle of him and God was gun smoke. <laughs> he was watching too many episodes of gun smoke. He says, yeah, i got to cut down the westerns. So, depending on what you, where your vision is, we always have to be letting, letting, go of, letting go of things that beset us. Now, if we're on our way to our vision, we're going to be off track most of the time. We have to make corrections. The vision's there. We're going to be off track. We start out here. We have to make corrections. Who is around to help you make corrections if you're trying to do everything yourself? If you don't have a humble, teachable spirit, how is somebody going to tell you? They'll tell. People want to tell us stuff, but they think, okay, if I tell her, she's going to say no. I think I'll just hold my peace. And they let you run into the wall. Right? But if they know you're going to listen, you're like, hey. Or if you, they have that place in your life, when they do tell you, then you'd be like, oh, okay. Right? So we have to open ourselves up for people to bring correction. And as they do, we can reach higher and higher. This is called, this is called staging. So if you feel yourself going to another level, are you, what, do you, what do you need to do? What do you need to, to let go of? So if you will allow me some latitude. What is, you ever notice... Pastor Tommy, there's times in the pulpit where he sounds like a preacher. There's other times in the pulpit it sounds more like a teacher. You've been hearing a lot of teaching coming from me, right? We're switching gears a little bit. That preacher anointing's on me, and I'm going to take advantage of it. All right. Make it loud. Um, we're, used to it. we're used to it. I know there are some hungry hearts in here that want to hear more. I'm going to call the advanced stuff. The stuff that comes down the road. Once a person has found obedience, and once a person has applied a plan, and once a person has applied discipline and practiced it and had victory over the flesh, we would get to what would be called the advanced stuff. 
I've been talking to you about the beginning stages, the, the stuff that allows you to do some rearranging to give you some structure. It allows you a place to stand on a solid rock. But I have to say, a lot of you are on sinking sand. Ouch. You're not hearing me. It sounds great, but you want to jump ahead. The Lord told me this morning to slow down. In the afternoon, I'm getting the same message. I'm still going too fast. So let me premise all of this by saying, the Lord takes his time. The Lord takes his time. He will never leave you where you are. He always wants you advancing, but he will take his time with treasures of his heart. He will continue to mold and embrace. He will repeat. Paul said, it's better for me to repeat this to you so that you get it. He will make sure that after me, another one and another one and another one and another one will come into your presence and give you the same exact message until what the Lord wants for you today hits you. You know, Kenneth Hagin preached the same message for a full year. The same message of faith for a full year. And then he spent the next 50 years preaching that same message again. What aren't you getting? Ground zero. Let's go back to the beginning. Kenneth Copeland spent an entire year last year just laying the foundations of faith all over again. He had so many new partners that didn't understand where he was coming from on the advanced teachings on the meat that he went back to the foundation. And he relayed that foundation for his partners. Not at the expense of the mature that had been following his ministry for three, four, and five decades, but rather for their edification also. Because the word of God never loses effect no matter how far you've ascended. This climb to this vision that you each have the climb to get to the place where you're debt-free, the climb to be successfully self-employed, the climb to be knowing the freedom that I'm talking about on that first slide where it says to know the freedom that's available to you. To do all of that, you have got to have your foundation. You have got to be on the rock that no matter what storm comes, the standing that I have talked about and preached about here remains. You are unshakable and unmovable. There are two things that you have going for you right now. Two things. Each other and your leadership. In your relation to the Lord, the strongest advocates you have are right now in this room to each other, the unity of the body. We talked about that this afternoon. And the Doubt leadership that the Lord has blessed you with. So we're going to be talking about two things tonight. And then I will get into, I promise you, I will get back at into financials for whatever time I have left. But I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to finish the Lord's work here. And I ask you to be expecting. I have said that message over and over and over. And tonight, unless you want another me coming through here, and if it takes a year, two years, whatever, you're going to decide that, what the timeline looks like. But I have a word for you tonight that internally will strengthen this church and lay a foundation that will encourage people to come to LifePoint and create a reputation as to why they belong at LifePoint. But hear me. Hear the Lord. Hear the Holy Spirit. Take all the lenses, wherever those crazy glasses are. Take all the lenses and allow yourself to be vulnerable. You remember yesterday afternoon? Do you remember yesterday afternoon? Everybody went out for 10 minutes, they satisfied their flesh. Whether it was the bathroom, coffee, water, conversation, phone, texting, whatever it was, emails, you catered to your flesh for 10 minutes. And we came back in this room, and in a matter of five, we were right back where you left this room at. You have the capacity, every single one of you has the capacity to be strong in spirit, to walk in the gifts that the Lord has anointed you with and to raise up to that position that God has appointed you in. 
I'm going to get you there tonight by talking about Job. And then I'm going to finish that story to teach you of your place by talking about helps. We're going to cover both of those, and they go together hand in hand, and they actually tie right in to what Randy just finished talking about here with climbing this ladder up. What do you know about Job? Keep talking. Uh, I mean, uh, but he was he was very favored by God, uh, attacked by the enemy because of his favor, tested by God. Uh, he also then uh, he lost everything and then wanted to question God about what was going on and got himself straightened out for about three chapters. And then after that, everything was doubled. He, he doubled back on the God because he, he humbled himself before. Who caused the calamity? Okay. Okay. I'm hearing a lot of good answers in here, but allow yourself to take some of these previous messages you've heard and allow the Holy Spirit to expand your mind a little bit here as I start talking about Job. You know how I've spent a couple of slides talking about because of you? This one's going to be titled because of Job. Okay? But in this lesson of Job, the Lord gave it to us because it so strongly ministers the relationship of sin and curse to grace and understanding. (coughs) It ties it so tight that I prayerfully believe it will not be stolen from you again. Job 1, 9 through 11. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him in his house that all that he has on every side? The hedge. The hedge. Weren't we just talking about the hedge in Malachi 3? That hedge is yours. It belongs to you. You create it by the tithe. And I, I will not ask for a raising of hands as to who tithes in this room. I don't let the Holy Spirit take care of that. But if you're not tithing, what did I say on the first night? If you're not tithing, if you're not tithing, go home. You're wasting your time. Go home. Get straight with the Lord. Figure out the tithe. Humble yourself and come back and learn. Your hedge. You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and surely he will curse you to your face. Satan himself acknowledged the goodness of God. Satan himself, our livid enemy that hates us and wants us, our, he doesn't want to just stop at still, steal and destroy. He wants death. He wants death. And yet Lucifer, Satan, the devil, says... You're a good God. You are a good God. Look what you've done for your servant. I can't even get close to him. He's way out of my reach. Satan believes that God is good. The demons know and they tremble. Do you? Do you? Satan comes before God and makes a legal claim on Job. We see on black and white, I pray your eyes would be open to see it in the spirit, but that legal battle that takes place over justice in heaven before the throne of Satan being permitted to come before Father God and make accusation against the brethren. What do you see in your mind when you hear that? I I think that's just an awesome picture of God's protection when Satan is continuously up there trying to say, did you see? Did you see? Did you know? And then being able to identify where the blessing of God is. How do you think demons were able to say, we know you. We know Paul. We know Jesus. How do you think the demons know that? The hedge. Are you tithing? God didn't lay a hand on Job. Satan carried out the evil. We all are in agreement on that. I heard that from several people already, that we understand that it was Satan and not the hand of God that came against Job. The question is why. 
Why was he allowed and permitted to come into Job's life? Why did God remove that protection? Fear? I'd like to go a little deeper than just a simple answer of fear. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in your power is in your power, only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. And I bet you he departed with a dance in his step. Satan left that throne of God and he had one agenda at that moment and it was like a lightning bolt. How fast this stuff came on Job that before the first messenger stopped speaking, the second messenger was already there waiting with bated breath to tell him what the next tragedy was. That's the book of Job. That's Satan. Satan departed from the presence of God. However, do you see the boundary? Do you see the leash that Satan was put on? All that he has is in your power, but on him do not lay a hand. Do you see how God is in control here? He has perfect control over the whole situation. Through all of this, the righteousness of Job, there's a line here that gives some credence to what I heard in this room. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Okay? That's Job 1.22. Job 2, 4, 6. Chapter 2, 4 through 6. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he'll give for his life. Put, your, put forth your hand now and touch his bone to his, and flesh, and he will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your power, but spare his life. There's another boundary. Again, Job 2, 10, same testimony. In all this, Job didn't sin. So what in the world? What's going on here? It seems like confusion, conflict against most of what we read in the rest of the Bible. Job 2, 11 and 13. Now, golly, if you've got friends like this. Enough said on that. Now, when Job's three friends came and heard of his adversity that he had come upon him, they came each one from his own place. The three names are there. They made an appointment to come together. Yeeha, I don't get one, I get three. They made an appointment. They wrote it on their calendar. Pencil me in to come together to sympathize and to comfort him. They sat down on the ground. He was such a wreck. They sat there for seven days and seven nights and just stared at him, watching him scratch himself. Picture that. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Job 6.4. Jumped ahead a little bit here. This is some of the conversation they had. The arrows of the Almighty are within me. Their poison, my spirit drinks. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Why did the hedge lift? Are these God's arrows? No. No. Who does Job blame? God. We're going to see a pattern here. Listen up. Job 9, 21 to 24. Although I am blameless, that's Job. Although I'm blameless, I have no concern for myself. I despise my own life. It is all the same. That is why I say he destroys. He, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. When a land falls into the hands of the wicked, he blindfolds its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? Are we seeing a pattern? Let's keep going. We're not done. Job does not know God. He doesn't know what God is like, and he's got a completely wrong perspective of God. I dare say that unless you see tithing rights existing in your life, and unless you see the prosperity of the Lord and the protection and divine health walking in your life, I dare say you have a misreputation of God. We have the privilege of the word of God that tells us who God, who God is. Job didn't have that luxury. He didn't have anything. He's the oldest book in the Bible. He's before the Abrahamic covenant. He had nothing. God held him accountable. He really did. But he didn't have our luxury. He didn't have the word of God. He didn't have every word of the Bible that we can grab anytime we want to. We probably have six in our house. Job 8, 1 through 7. How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? 
This is one of the friends. Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. I just want to leave that hanging right there. When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. If you, rouse, rouse, excuse me, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. And we know about the kids. They were throwing parties, and uh, Job would go continuously and make an offering on behalf of his kids just in case they had sinned. That's where the fear teaching comes from, is from that verse. Just in case they had sinned. Okay? You can definitely put a fear label in there, but I think we're going to see a different pattern in here. The kids were probably living an ungodly life, and Bildad is telling Job that he cannot blame God for what happened to the kids because the kids were probably not being good little boys and girls. So Job says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. All right. Though he slay me, how do we trust a God that tomorrow is going to slay us? How do we believe in a good, good father if he's willing to strike you down? If he's willing to take things away? If he's just up there just saying, we're going to pick on him today. You cannot go through life with an attitude that God has anything less but his best intention for you. However that ministers to you in your own language and in your own filtration, you have got to get through to yourself that God's very best interest and intent is toward you, personally. Chapter 32, it says, The three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, son of Barakai, this is the young one. This is the young generation coming in. The young people in this room, you don't think you may have a loud enough voice against some of the elders if they're uh, needing correction? Guess what? These three men and Job heard an earful from this kid. They became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job. So the three shut up because he was righteous in his own sight. And then he's also angry at the three because they had no way of shutting him down or getting him to change his mind. And yet they had condemned him. Now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because he was, they were older than he was. So he was a very respectful young man waiting for age and his elders. But when he, went, when he saw the three men and no more to say, his anger was aroused. There's a key point in here. You cannot help someone that is righteous in their own sight. If you do not find humility, that condition of spirit that ushered in the anointing yesterday to such a powerful degree, if that condition of heart does not become the stability of your life, this is going to be a hard road because you are going to know what is available and you will never find it. And if you do find it, it will not be through spiritual means. You're going to toil and labor to get there. It'll be frustrating and it's going to tire you out. Elihu says, But you have said in my hearing, I heard your very words, I'm pure, I've done no wrong, I'm clean and free from sin. Yet God has found fault with me, he considers me his enemy. Do you hear the logic here? These are Job's words being repeated back to him. I'm pure, I've done no wrong, and I'm clean. I'm free from sin. However, God still found fault in me, and he considers me his enemy. He fastens my feet in shackles. He keeps a close watch on all of my paths. But I tell you, in this you are not right, for God is greater than any mortal. This guy's getting close. He's getting really close. Again, he continues, Job has, Job has said, I'm innocent. God denies me justice. Although I'm right... I'm considered a liar. Although I'm guiltless, his arrow inflicts an incurable wound. Is there anyone like Job who drinks scorn like water? He keeps company with evildoers. He associates with the wicked, for he says there is no profit in trying to please God. Then the Lord finally says, enough, Job, enough. Now we talked this morning in Malachi. God was not condemning 
his audience in Malachi, nor is he condemning you. Rather, God does not condemn, but when he tells us to do something or brings correction, what's his motive? Let's go even love that wants to get something to us. Love gives. He wants to get something to us. He's not condemning Job here. He is trying to open Job's eyes to receive correction. You cannot help somebody that is righteous in their own sight. God comes down like a firestorm and says, who are you that's confusing who I am and speaking without knowledge? He's trying to bring Job to repentance. And the Holy Spirit was sent for what purpose? To bring us to repentance. To bring us in that state of spirit that we were in yesterday afternoon that allows us to be so much in the presence of God that he can do anything he wants with us, tell us anything, and we're not going to argue with him. We're not going to be the discouraging word to God that he spoke yesterday to all of you, to all of us. Who is it that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? God is trying to position Job to humble himself to receive correction. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you will answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? And then Job makes his reply. Let me just say, and I was telling Pastor Tommy over dinner tonight, that when this level of presence comes, when this level of presence of the Lord, like a firestorm, that he speaks out of a storm, when that anointing hits you, he comes to wipe away every tear. When that presence is on you, if your reply in response to the Lord is tears, then cry. But he comes in love. And that love is so thick and it's so powerful, he wipes away every tear. It is the most painless, beautiful, immersing and amazing experience to receive an anointing of correction from the Lord to come and rest upon you, to bring you into repentance so that God can get something more into your life. If that is where you're at, give permission to the Holy Spirit to do it, to bring you into that resting place, the shadow of the Almighty, where he is allowed to put you into such a restful position of peace that the Holy Spirit has free reign to do as he pleases to prepare you for greater things. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. The Lord is so holy and he is so amazing and yet gentle and loving. Job says, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things that I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears heard and my eyes now see. Make that your testimony. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Repentance. Speak it once Put it under the blood. East from the west, it's over and done. Do not entertain it again. It's finished. After Job repented, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former. Sin is choosing to step outside the legal parameters of heaven. Choosing because of you. Sin is choosing to step outside justice. Sin is choosing to remove yourself from the hedge, to bring yourself outside of the protection of God where his hand can no longer protect you, to literally step into the presence of Satan. When Pastor Steve called to our attention the fact that we played a game, not a single person prayed, not a single person was led of the Holy Spirit, we all answered wrong, we lost. What was the last thing he said? We served who? Pretty harsh comment, isn't it? To a room full of believers, of spirit-filled believers, harsh comment there? But if you're not serving the Spirit, who are you serving? Sin is choosing to step outside the legal parameters of heaven. When sin exists, Satan can accuse you at the throne of God, just like he did with Satan, with, with Job. And God needs to say, he's in your hands. She is in your hands. That's justice. That's sin existing in your life. 
That's justice. James testifies of Job in the New Testament. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance, patience, and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You are going to be a leg up hearing this for the sermon tomorrow. You're getting a jump start, a head start on tomorrow's message. God was trying to help Job all along, and what God finally brought about is Job was humbled and received correction. He was full of himself. His ego, his pride, his self-reliance, his independence. Any of those words sound familiar to you? That was Job's state. That was Job's condition. If you are eight steps in front of God tonight, if you've heard all of this information as to where the foundation is at, and you're still supposed to be back at ground zero, you're out of place. You lose. Job did not bail. He misunderstood God, but he continued to trust him. In all of this, Job did not sin. That was the testimony before the three friends showed up. In all of this, Job did not sin. With a wife saying, curse God and die, Job did not sin. That's a spouse. Job persevered and he did not quit. And so I encourage you, I exhort you, do not bail on God. You may not understand your situation or what's happening in your life right now, but you need to understand that God is good. I said on one of my slides that your purpose, destiny, your vision may be cloudy and concealed at the moment because of where things are at because of your choices. But it is never, ever more than God can handle for you. Never. In all things, God works to our good. Romans 8.28. It does not say that God causes all things, but rather that he works in all things for the purpose of our good. In the midst of the trial... In the midst of the pressure, your trial, your pressure, he is trying to get his good to you. If you ask him and wait on him, you will find it. Job found it. He did it the hard way. A really, really, really hard way. And I've said it several times already that it's in our lowest place, it's in the lowest moment of our lives that we can make the greatest advances with God. I would much sooner see each one of you find that low place of humility and the presence of the living God on your own volition, voluntarily, in your space and in your time than for God to have to make you get a face plant in order to get there. And I can speak with confidence that the face plant is in front of you if you don't do this. Why? Why can I predict a face plant? God will not leave you where you're at. He will not. So does that put a new light on Job? The quick version? The microwave version? But pop it to you fast and let it hit you? Job is an amazing book. And if you really look at the different segments of Job and put all together what's going on, there is a lot happening in Job. There's a lot of players in Job. Read it through the lens of love and God's presence and goodness and watch how Job ministers back to you of God's goodness. Even though a lot of people want to read Job and blame God that he's trying to teach me something with this cancer or that my poverty is keeping me humble. You're like the three friends. With an attitude like that. God help us. I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to be handing out these sheets tonight. But this is just... Scripture I've referenced, it's encouragement, it piggybacked with everything we've talked about, it's the scriptural side of things. 
But I wrote down here at the bottom, as an heir, a child, a son, a daughter of the kingdom of God, you've been given full rights and benefits to everything the kingdom has to offer. Free will leaves it up to you to walk out the victory which is already yours. You can choose it or you can choose not. Matthew 6.24 says you cannot serve both God and money. The tough question is, is which one are you actually relying on? As you leave here, is your faith bolstered enough as you walk out this door to tell money, I no longer trust you? You are no longer my friend or my ally in any way. My God supplies my needs and money, you're nothing but a tool. You are only a tool for me to live in this world so that I may do the purpose of the living God and no longer serve you, mammon, or man. The bondage that debt puts you in doesn't just affect you, it affects all of your possibilities and for generations. What is debt robbing you of? Make a list. You want to get angry? Righteous indignation and want to pick up a whip and clean out the temple a little bit? Make a list of the things that debt's robbed you of. Get angry at debt. You're allowed. It's a curse. You will never, never fulfill the purpose God has designed for you until you know your proper position in Christ. Thus, the intro to tomorrow's message. You must have a proper understanding of who God is, that he is good and his intention towards you is also good. You also need knowledge of who God is And you're going to get that from the Bible. I realize I put that in one of my slides. It's the second time we've been over this. That's all right. His love letter and every answer to life is found in it. It is good for me to say again unto you. It is for your benefit to have repetition. If you can't teach it, learn it again. If you can't take this on the street or present the same God is good message, love never fails to the next person that walks into life point, sit through the message again. Or find another teacher on the subject and listen to them until you get it. Become a teacher. Take your place in the kingdom as you rightly belong and is about to talk about here as we switch gears just a little bit, that now that we know that God is good, that all of us have an inheritance as the son and daughter of the living king, we all understand or on the same page that we're all ministers of the living God, that every one of you is called into ministry. There isn't a single person in this room that's exempt from that. You all have a place in the kingdom. And do you realize that you are a selfish person to not step into that role? Do you realize that you're a thief yourself if you don't take your position? You rob the rest of life point of your gifts, your talents, and what God wants to do through you if you won't step up. If you don't stand your ground against the enemy and take back that ground and become what God wants you to be, you have robbed the church. And robbing the church is the same as Will you rob me? How have we robbed you? You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. God has appointed, key words in this passage, God has appointed, he has set and installed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps and administrations. Helps and administrations, rendering practical aid and support. Rendering practical aid and support. The helps ministry offers practical aid and support to whom first? Who gave us, who said that? Somebody back here. The helps ministry is a gift to the church appointed by God for our leadership first. Do you realize that their burnout is your fault? Anything to say on that, Randy? 
No. Mm. All right. Pastor has the vision. You're here to support that vision in whatever place the Lord places you in. You are called here to find your place in the body, to serve in that role as unto the Lord himself in order to make sure that these two are freed up like in the book of Acts, that they are devoting themselves to the word of God and to prayer. Because if they are not devoting themselves to the word of God and to prayer, they are off doing something else like making coffee, not spending time with the Lord, not refilling up under the anointing and taking on that vision of the Lord, and failing you because they have to fill the void you left open. You see the merry-go-round here? Do you see how the body of Christ is one body, separate members, but working together for a common goal? It's the ministry of helps. Now, I will pause for a minute. Where is Kelsey in this room? Kelsey. God bless you. You're a man of talent. You're a man of obedience. And you're a man that's searching hard. And it's coming. You're finding what you're looking for. You're a leader. Do you see yourself as a leader? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God's got you, and he's got you in a good place. This is a good church. You're admired here. Yes. Very much so. But what is your place? You don't have to answer that. I won't put you on the spot anymore. <laughs> Silence. Find out. Get before the most high and find out. Next time I get in your face like that, I want an answer. It's not necessary for pastor to come to you and say, this is your place in the church. To be recognized, to be asked, absolutely. But for that request, prayer request, please pray with me. I think that this is what the Lord is asking of me. This might be my position to come humbly to leadership and say, I believe this is where the Lord would want me to. If you don't believe I'm ready yet, would you please train me and disciple me to be ready for that position? How am I doing, Randy? Kind of stepping on your toes here a little bit. No answer. How? Helps is a participation in the support of the ministry. To support... Pardon? Well, I realize that. I thank you for the gracious yeah, opportunity so, to have some... So you're just like doing all this stuff, and now I don't have to do it. Because you're doing it. Because we're a team. We do this together. Amen to that. Amen. For life. Amen. All right. So you are here to support the life and vision. Life is a very large word in this sentence. The life and vision of leadership. Their livelihood the sanctity of their marriage, the peace in their hearts and their minds, the vision for the church, the anointing, and the mantle of God are protected by you. You get that? Your tithes that create your hedge, that keep the devourer off your back and open the windows of heaven and demonstrate obedience to the living God because you're tithing your income, That's part of the livelihood. This all comes together in one great big embrace of love. I think you're doing good. Thank you. (laughs) That delayed response. (laughs) Pastor has goals and visions for the church that he cannot accomplish by himself. It wasn't built that way. God did not ordain any pastor to be an island of its own, trying to support, build up, organize, manage and teach a body of believers by himself. Now, there are pastors that take that role on because they don't know how to manage, they don't know how to delegate, and they're doing it all on their own, and we're falling out at the tune of 1,500 pastors a month, a month, are resigning. A month, and only like 20% of pastors that begin pastoring retire their ministry as a pastor. 20% survive a whatever lifespan career in the ministry. Why? Because these folks don't understand their role to these folks. Mm -hmm. 
If you're helping anyone in the church, including staff, or the weak and the needy, you're serving in the ministry of helps, especially when you do it because somebody else then doesn't have to do it. Administrations. That's helps, administrations. Administrations is not a governing body of the church. That administrations is not a governing, decision-making body of the church. Rather, this is a position that coordinates or takes charge of a designated area of helps. Speaking to you. Leader. Amen? The leaders, however they are designated by Pastor Tommy, enter into a position appointed by God called administrations. Administrations gives oversight to the helps. So that if helps has a question or there's a problem, it is filtered and the fire's put out before it ever makes it to leadership who should be in their Bible praying and spending time with God so that he can serve you better in the pulpit. There's a buffering that occurs within the church biblically between helps and administrations and the pastoral leadership. God has appointed, installed the helps ministry administration within the church. It is God who has done this. And an appointed, that word in the Greek, appointed or installed, does not mean temporary. It does not mean a part-time job that one day I'm going to leave because there's greener pastures. If you truly feel you're appointed and installed, pastor will recognize you. You will be appointed, but it's not for a week. Serve faithfully. Every born-again child of God is called by God into the church, which is the body of Christ, and you absolutely need to belong to a local church body. Do not forsake the gathering or fellowshipping of yourselves together. And you are installed the moment that you are born again. It's just a matter now of discovering what that installment looks like to you and you as a member of that body. This is not about seeking favor or accolades from man. This is not about trying to earn a badge. There's only one person you're working for and appointed by, and that is to serve your Lord in complete abandon to yourself, in pure love, for the sake of another. It is only and always about Jesus and serving our Father. There is not anyone in this room that's more important than you. There is not anyone in this room that is more important than you. There's nobody in this room that's more important than you. God's position certain ministries within the church to serve in a supportive role. These are helps and administrations, and the supportive roles are as essential to the church growth as the pastoral position himself. We just spent the whole weekend talking about that, but let this information mold its way into all the information you've gotten from Randy and the other insight of the Holy Spirit that you have been, has been revealed to you. There's a lot of examples in the Bible. Moses said, I am alone I alone am not able to carry all this people. I am not alone. <laughs> I alone am not able to carry all this people because it is too burdensome for me. So Moses was a leader appointed by God, pastor. Moses was unable to handle the daily responsibilities. There's no way a congregation of 50 is going to be handled by one person or 250 or 400. Each of us are to help with the daily responsibilities of the church. Daily responsibilities of the church. Not showing up on Sunday morning, ushering and saying, I've done my deed, Lord. Going home. Amen. We've got the example of the gentleman that held Moses' arms up when they were getting tired and weary. What are you doing to support his arms? Aaron and her. Aaron and her, that's right. I'm just going a little bit faster here. The disciples asked for help with seven deacons serving tables so that they could devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Even Jesus asked for help. What? what? Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus himself. You know he wasn't poor. 
Really? Really? That he went back to Capernaum to his home? But where do you live? Yeah, where am I from? Jesus relied on the help of the disciples in numerous different situations. All right. The ministry of helps, or the support of the daily and the physical needs of the church, is not an assignment for only a select few to carry the weight. This is an all-inclusive thing, and the assignment is placed on every member of the church. And he calls you by name. He knows you by name. He hasn't looked over you, overlooked you. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Caleb, Caleb, how are you serving me? How are you serving me? I have a place for you. High and lifted up. Are you there? Amen. God needs each one of us to show up and know our place in the body of Christ, the one that God has appointed us to. We do not get to choose. If you do not, the body is weaker. The church will never reach its full maturity. You rob others of your gift. A substitute will have to be found because God needs the void filled for their sake. And one day each believer will face the judgment seat of Jesus Christ where every word and work is tried, both good and bad, and I missed it is not an excuse. As God's people, we should be looking for ways to bless and relate to our pastor. We should be asking the Lord on our knees how we are to bless and relate to our pastor. Relate to the pastor. What does that word relate mean to you? What does it mean to relate? Common, okay, common ground. Relate. I'm going to be calling on you later. Just so you know, if you're not afraid of being put on the spot. Just so you know. (laughs) (laughs) Seeing seeing their needs before, being there for their needs before they arrive, so being prepared. Whew, we're getting real close now. Yeah, to relate to your pastor. What's pastor's favorite color? When's his birthday? Red, April something. Are they right? Oh, we know he likes fishing, yeah. I know when their anniversary is. Do you realize that a birthday and an anniversary should not go by without a love offering for these two? You should never, ever, ever miss a significant day in their lives. Never miss. Our leadership does remember, so we don't. Okay, bring that from leadership to the lowest levels. Bring it all the way through the ranks and make it an available love offering to them. To relate to your pastor, we should desire to understand our responsibility to God in the way that we treat our pastoral staff. If you don't understand how to relate to the pastor, if that sounds foreign to you and it's new information and it just sounds uncomfortable for any reason, take it before the Lord and I promise you, he will bring you some Job correction. He will not leave you there because it is critical to God's heart that you understand and know your pastor's. As much as we expect our pastor to be poured out for us, did you hear that? As much as we expect, you come on Sunday morning, tomorrow morning, you are going to expect me to show up in here and pour myself out on your behalf. As much as you are expecting that of them, to be steadfast to that week on week on week, they should be able to expect it of you. Have you ever poured yourself out for the pastor? The truths in the Bible will establish the right relationship with your pastor and much faster accomplish the goals that Jesus Christ has for this church. How am I doing? 
that was it. You're doing good. First Corinthians one twenty seven. And this is a word for life point. This is a word for you specifically. And I'm going to read it that way. If you got your Bible, 1 Corinthians 1.27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. To the world, a body of believers meeting in a hotel conference room week on week and believing for better things like land and a building and growth that people that would actually walk through the door of the lobby of a hotel to come to church looks foolish. It looks foolish to the infidels, to the world, to the non-believers. But what does it say there? God chose. God chose. Life point. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and God has chosen the base things of the world and things which are despised. Yes, and he chose things which did not exist to bring to nothing that things that do, so that no flesh should boast in his presence, but because of him, because of him, because of him, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, whom God made unto us wisdom, righteous, sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. There is nothing foolish going on here, and there is absolutely nothing that any of you or anyone that comes to the door should ever be embarrassed about. You should not be embarrassed to say, I go to Life Point Church. We meet at the hotel. Do you hear his announcements during the announcements on a Sunday morning? He looks into the camera and with joy and peace and even pride in his heart, We welcome you to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings to our service at the hotel conference room. That is awesome. Higher ground. Ooh, I was on. Sorry. I didn't mean to scream that at you. (laughs) At least you heard me. Can I hear you now? All right, insurance. Low-hanging fruit. Let's talk about insurance. You want to put more money in your monthly budget every month? Go after insurance. You heard what Amber said. She's already contacted her insurance agent, said she's shopping rates. There is nothing that gets the attention of your insurance agent faster than to go up to him and say, I'm shopping rates. You watch what they can do for you when you go to the insurance agent and say, I'm shopping rates. Because how does an insurance agent get paid? Commissions on each, thank you, commissions on each policy that is written they take a cut of the premium, and their cut of premium is handsome. Handsome. They are well paid. They work hard. Sales is not the most fun career unless you really, really, really have a heart for it, but insurance agents get paid very well. So they're motivated, and when you're motivated, negotiation becomes an option. Got that? All right. So the low-hanging fruit, I call this Literally, this is the stuff where if you are, what? Oh, oh, down here. So those agencies like, you know, insurance is so huge. You've got kind of like these side guys, but then you got these big name companies like the State Farms and stuff. Does it still work the same way when you've got like a State Farm? Oh, Absolutely. Your, We're by the speakers. I'm so probably too close to you. The largest corporate campuses, as you're driving around, that are customer service related are of what industry? Insurance. Their campuses are amazing. We have some in Wisconsin that just make you drive by and say, whoa, look at this place. (laughs) Humana. Um, I mean, just start naming some of the bigger progressive, some of these bigger customers or bigger companies And we're talking thousands of agents, thousands of offices, and an income stream, or I should say an asset holding account that would make your mind just stagger. I mean, these companies are holding billions of dollars. And so when you pay your premium, you got to know that they're not breaking even, right? 
you're paying a premium, yes, they've got losses. There's claims against the money that they're holding. But with the rest of the money, what are they doing with it? Investing. investing. The very next subject we're getting to, as soon as we clear insurance, I'm going to talk about investments. They're investing it. They not only have full-time, I know I'm running out of time. They not only have full-time agents and all of the clergy, the clergy, oh my goodness, <laughs> clerical <laughs> positions under their roof, but they have their own in-house brokers because there is such an infusion of cash that comes to them every month. In-house brokers, asset managers. Okay, shopping insurance can have a huge impact on your budget. Insurance is necessary and in some states is even required. In Iowa, are you required to carry auto insurance? Is it mandatory? Okay. High deductibles save money. Now you may shiver at that thought. $1,000 deductible on my car, $2,000 on my house, whatever numbers you may be comfortable with, you will save money if you raise your deductible but you know that cash reserve that we've created because you sold the Trans Am sitting in the garage? Uh, maybe against your husband's will? Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, your cash reserve, that's what it's there for, situations like that. Raise your deductible, save 50 or 80 bucks a month on a higher deductible, and if there is a oopsies, pull into your cash reserve, pay the higher deductible, you're gonna come out in the end better by saving money every single month by not paying for that lower deductible. All right, pay premiums yearly, not monthly. There's a 12% discount with most companies if you pay an annual premium. If you can afford it, to go and pay that premium on a 12-month basis instead of a monthly basis, there's another 12% back in your pocket of the total cost of the premium. And added to that is also the, umbre uh, not the umbrella, but doing a basket of insurance that if you own a home, you own a car, your wife owns a car, and you want an umbrella policy for liability, on yourself, put them all under the same agency, you'll get another 12% discount. So you've just dropped 24%. You pay the annual fee and you do a basket of goods, you've made an agent very, very happy and you get to enjoy a, a credit on what you're paying. Insurance agencies have their own in-house rules. That is a big one. In the state of Michigan, in the state of Michigan, I'm from another state, you need to check it for yourself in Iowa. Who in here has teenagers that you are responsible for? One? All right. Maybe you know somebody. In the state of Michigan, uh, the vehicle, actually in Iowa, just ask you this question, is the vehicle insured or is the driver insured? The vehicle. The vehicle. Same as Michigan. The vehicle carries the insurance. So when you get pulled over, does the police officer say, may I see your insurance or does he say, I want to see insurance and registration of the vehicle. Amen to that. Some of us cannot boast that. It's the car registration and the car insurance. It doesn't matter who's driving the car, unless there's a citation issued, but it doesn't matter who's driving the car. In the state of Michigan, your teenager that lives under your roof, as long as there are not more cars than adult drivers, mom and dad, two vehicles, you do not need to insure your teenager at the tune of two to $300 a month. However, what a lie and a deception in the insurance world that I have yet to have a class where anybody in the class knew that. I called the state police. I said, do I really need to insure my kid? No, but you might have trouble with the insurance company. Okay but I'm legal not to insure Elena, and now Grace is gonna be driving. I've got 500 bucks a month right there that I'm not paying in car insurance. That's a big deal. So insurance, however, has their own rules. You have to get past the insurance company because their in-house rule is every legal driver in the household must have insurance or we drop you. And they'll do that. They really will. So find an agent that's going to write the policy for you with only mom, dad as drivers, and not worry about the dependents. They're out there. They really are, because they know the law. And if the insurance company tries to enforce that, shop insurance. OK? That's what I mean by the insurance companies have their own rules. What about PMI? We talked about that already. I can skip right past that one and keep giddy up here. All right, this is a fantastic grid right here that I just created and plugged into here. We're gonna talk about life insurance quick because I'm sure, what, half of you? Who, who has life insurance policies in here? Okay, 
Do you know? Only if you know. Raise your hand if it's whole life. One, two, three. Okay, who in here has term life? Anybody have term? Over there, a couple of you with term. Way to go. I'm going to prove why you're right. Okay? You're right. Insurance policies are running with personal wealth. When you first start off in life, you young ones in here, and you want to make sure that you've got insurance, whether it's for making sure that your home is covered if something happens to you, or if you've got family and you want to make sure that they're taken care of, when you start in life and you've got very little self-wealth or maybe you've only got debt, you insure or you rent another person's money to cover you upon tragedy, upon something that may happen to you, and that's where insurance comes in. So insurance has peaked out at a young age. As we go through life, every 10, 20, 30 years, you adjust your insurance downward because as you build self-wealth, you no longer need somebody else's money to make sure that your loved ones are okay. You can stop paying somebody to cover for a family that already has retirement accounts or equity in a home or money put aside in some fashion. And so you lower your coverage in conjunction with where you're at with your self-wealth. By the time you retire, if you've lived life correctly, you should be able to cancel insurance altogether, leaving an inheritance for your children's children. All right? That's the purpose of life insurance, is to make sure that people are taken care of if something happens to you. Now, I asked a full gospel uh, insurance agent, I said, what about with long life will I give unto you? Psalm 91. With long life, will I satisfy you? I said, what about that? Why do I need insurance? He said, Steve, I, we were friends. He was allowed. He said, Steve, if you can look me in the eye and tell me that you walk perfectly in the spirit, perfectly in love, 24 hours a day, and you never, ever, ever give a foothold in your life to the devil, don't get insurance. But if you can't look me in the eye and tell me that you're not 24 hours perfect, you better do something for your family. I thought that was a good answer. It's wrong to think that you're supposed to have life insurance for your whole life. Insurance is to be adjusted as your net worth increases. It's the same as renting on another person's money until time passes and you are able to be self-insured. Whole versus term. All right. For those of you that have whole life policies, I'm sorry, but I'm going to insult you. Whole life saves money within the policy with a cash value. So your whole life policies, you're paying in a very dear premium month after month after month, and that policy holds a cash value to it, a percentage, 80%. Let's say it's $100,000 that you've paid into your whole life policy. Well, that's your money. But if you want to see your money, or if you need your money, even though they're holding it and they have invested at 12 to 16% returns by their in-house brokers, you need to pay interest on your money in order to get it back into your pocket. You pay interest and still have to pay it back. It's a loan based on your own savings account. It'd be no different than you going into the bank and saying, would you please put my money in a savings account and I'll pay you interest for it. That's a whole life policy. And it's expensive. So for a $250,000 whole life policy, there's a very good chance that a 35-year-old is going to pay probably close to $4,000 a year for that whole life policy. You could go to that same insurance agent and say, quote the same thing, $250,000 death benefit, 35-year-old non-smoker, but on term life, your policy is going to cost you about 25 bucks a month. So what do you do? If you're paying whole life right now, for those of you that have whole life and have the discipline to have life insurance in your life, get rid of the whole life but ask a lot of questions as to what happens to the cash value of the policy before you do it, okay? Get rid of the whole life, and what you've been paying on that policy for whole life, start putting it into your own control of a pension fund, a retirement fund, a mutual fund, invest it in your own financial planning, and take advantage of the thousands of dollars a year that you're paying in the whole life policy, build your own self-worth in a portfolio, and then cancel it all together. You what? You've got a hybrid. Yeah. And okay, it's not the usual policy that they sell anymore today. Right, they don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I'm very so she's blessed, mm -hmm. and it may be called whole life, but it's a hybrid that can't really be called whole life in today's terminology. Okay? Yeah. Being self employed, I don't have any benefits, right? So, what would you suggest? 
Term life. And yeah. Term life. Okay. 25, 30 bucks a month. Get coverage, build wealth, cancel it. Adjust as you go along. But term life. I would never, ever recommend whole life to anybody. It is expensive. And to pay interest on your own money, that's nuts. What else do I have up here? Uh, if you want the money out that you paid, you borrow and pay interest against your own funds. You're charged interest on your own investment. Term life does not have a cash value, and the premiums will increase as you get older, but they stay so cheap. The same death benefit premium for term life is much less expensive than the whole life. Put safe premiums towards debt or into an investment outside of an insurance company. Okay? All right, credit life. Have anybody ever heard of credit life or disability? Yes. You go to a car dealership and they say, do you want credit life or do you want disability? And it's really, really expensive. Write a letter today, right now, and tell them to cancel it. It'll take a letter and it may take three weeks before it actually cancels, but they put that on top of your loan payment every month. It is very, very expensive and it's utterly useless. You are much better off just going ahead and paying instead of 80 bucks a month on your car payment that is already four and $500, you're better off paying 30 on a term life policy for 250,000 than paying $80 that all it does is pay off your car loan. That's disability and credit life. It's expensive because there's no pre-qualification. They have to give it to everybody that wants it. They have to give it. So the sickly, the ones that shouldn't even be driving a vehicle, they all get it so it's expensive. It's added to the premium offered. Yeah, it's offered and solicited with major purchases and it'd be canceled with a letter. You have to write a letter. Better to buy your own term life that'll cover your debts, and disability insurance is another one, but again, you can get disability insurance through your own local agent, it'd be a lot cheaper. Yeah? Steve, you're saying for people who get that, and that extra money that gets, they finally pay off the loan, they're not getting any of that money back. It was no. Just, no, it's you're just again like, renting coverage in case something happens, the okay. just in case. Mm -hmm. Get term, and if something happens, cash in on the disability or the term, it's going to be 20% of the cost of what they're charging you, and it's going to be a lot more, there'll be a lot more coverage. 15 minutes. All right, yeah. I had something really off the wall happen, and it happened at the end of it. I thought, it's got to be God thing. But I, I told you earlier that I was in a, an abusive marriage. When we were married, I took out an insurance policy on him for $25,000 just in case something happened to him and we have three kids. And I wanted some kind of a cushion to be able to find a job and, and you take care of the kids until I was able to find a job and stuff. And then we got divorced, okay? And this was, I think it was in the 90s when I got, took out this policy. My ex-husband passed away in 2016 and we buried him on the money from that policy. I doubt it very much that he ever made any, any payments on it, but he took out a $5,000 loan against it. What happened there? I mean, what, because he took out the $5,000 loan, is that what kept that policy alive? I mean, I doubt very much he ever made any payments on it. Has the bank ever come after you as being the ex-spouse? Well, they, I had to give all the information as, you know, because it was my married name that was on the policy. Yeah. And I had to give all the information for that. And they sent, they, well, they sent me half of, the, half of it and they sent the other half to the mortuary. Okay. But they didn't I, keep anything to pay off of what, what should have been a note out there somewhere. Well, the, it was, well they the only paid out the difference. Yeah, yeah, they paid, they paid the, the difference. difference. There we go. The difference plus interest. It was about $17,000. Okay. How? I mean, I, I, knowing the man, he could have, but I doubt very much he ever made a payment on it. How in the world? They just accrued interest and then took the principal upon death. They got paid for it. They really did. Okay. So if they only got back 17 on a $25,000 policy and it was a $5,000 loan, there's $3,000 of interest that they took. It's over 50%. Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't have slides, because I didn't know if I was going to get here or not. And I'm really cautioning myself on the vast interest that's in this room on financial planning. And I don't want to be unjust to any one of you. Because financial planning is an exciting topic. It's awesome to see that chart and see what can happen exponentially in your portfolio. 
I have to honor those of you that are in here that are debt-free at the same time, but I caution the ones that are not that this is education for down the road. You don't have any business toying around with possibly losing money in the stock market when there's other people that are taking money out of your pocket called interest. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Let me go back to, you don't need to keep up with me on the slides. I'm going to go back to here. All right. This person ends, for those of you that are not debt-free, and you're going to have one of these looking as Amber is boots on ground and uses her boots against you to make sure you get into every office that you need to go to to get your budget in line, she's still got those military boots. You better watch it. She'll use them. She knows how to use them. All right. For those of you that are still in debt, you're going to be writing up one of these plans. This number down here and the celebration and happy dance that comes after you are debt-free down here, that becomes now, that's still not your money. No, no, no. It's closer to being your money, but it's still not your money. You don't go out and all of a sudden just start spending money like crazy because you just paid yourself out of debt. This becomes your portfolio. This amount right here now, the 2042, is what you now go and open up an investment account of your choosing as the Lord leads, and you start pumping that into your retirement. And run the future value calculator on this kind of money for whatever age you're at and retirement at whatever age you want to be at and find how fast that money grows in a good mutual fund. You know what I'm saying? $2,000 a month going into a mutual fund, on average, the stock market is going up 12% a year. Here lately, since Donald Trump was elected, <laughs> rock and roll. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, the 2000 you start putting into an investment account, and that just becomes a regular payment of your own doing and your own discipline to secure your retirement and to start building that inheritance for children's children. And you keep living on what you have disciplined yourself to be living on, unless the Lord directs you otherwise, by the time you get out of debt, it's very likely that your income has gone up and that you're in a better place in life and that you will not miss this money and still maintain a decent lifestyle and be debt-free. Amen. Amen? All right. So what about the investments? Where do you start? This is a... I spent an entire semester... At, so would that be before or after you put some type of savings for emergency funds? Well, the cash reserve like is first, yeah. The balance budget and the cash reserve are the two, first two things you're going after. Get that cash reserve built up, then do your payment plan, get the debt paid off, and then comes the retirement, the investment planning, the wealth management, okay? That would be the sequence of things in doing this um, in the most efficient, the, the, the shortest timeline, put it that way. For those of you that are debt-free, or yeah? Oh, absolutely. A balanced budget. I've got the budget sheets. There's still a stack here for those of you that need them. A balanced budget. You want a positive line on your budget. You want to stick to your plan. You want to stay in that budget. Along with the budget, you want a cash reserve of two to $3,000. It's usually one month's expenses would be the minimum that you want in that cash reserve. The cash reserve is what would cover things like your deductible on a higher car deductible if there was an accident. Once you've got those two play things in line, there is also still the tools of finding money and canceling things or selling things to build up that reserve and to balance your budget. Once you have those, you write up this debt plan, which Amber would love to help you with. <laughs> Talk about putting you on the spot, eh? And once you've got that debt plan and you exercise that debt plan and you achieve the goal of that debt plan, now you look at your investment accounts. To start with the investment accounts, you have to do what's called in the broker world, risk appetite. Risk appetite. The more you're attached to money, the less risk is going to exist in your being. They always say you can only invest money that you're willing to part with because there's no guarantee you're going to ever see it back again. You are investing in the highest risk uh, area that there is. You're investing in the fact that whatever company you're going into is going to remain ethical and profitable without you having any say in the matter. That's a stock investment. Five. I thought you were saying hi. All right. Then there's the mutual fund. You can open up your own broker account. There are 100 different websites out there. 
where you can start as low as $500 a month, or $500 as initial entry, and you get three months of free trades, and you can do all your own research and all your own trades, and you can do quite well if you're disciplined and have even a two-hour or three-hour education at some of these trading schools that are online that you can read through on the articles. They're actually very good. And you can start trading and, and find out what your liking is. If you're a day trader where you buy something in the morning, you hold it until midday and get rid of it before the markets slow down because of time zones and other nations. Or you can go long-term trading, or you can go actually through a brokerage where you tell them, I want this invested specifically in the NASDAQ, which is techs or the blue chips of New York Stock Exchange. Whichever it is that your appetite allows, you can go into a mutual fund, which is where you're turning your money over to a broker and they become an asset manager of a multitude of clients in the billions of dollars and they are doing large purchases of commodities. They're doing all the research for you and you just simply get a prospectus each year, a portfolio review each year of how the performance of that fund has been for the past year. Now you're gonna to talk to your broker about front end fees and back end fees and front loaded and back loaded and tax implications. And I do wanna bring one thing to your attention that if you get into investments, there's this thing called capital gains. Capital gains are determined by how long you held the asset before the asset is sold and you take a profit. If the asset is sold for less than one year, your tax bracket may be as high as 40%. That if you bought that thing for 10,000, you sold it for 20,000 in six months, great job, good insight, good profit. You made a $10,000 gain in less than a year. The government's gonna want four of it. Bless their hearts. Bless their hearts. If you hold an asset for a year and a day, you could pay taxes as low as 20 to 12%, 12 to 20, without taking any credits or expenses against it as income. So a capital gain that's over one year becomes much less of a tax implication against you with whatever profit you enjoy from that sale. Choosing a broker. Pray. They're not all the same. Their fees can vary tremendously. And they can be too safe. A CPA can be too safe. You know how I chose my CPA? The same way I would choose a broker. But I chose a CPA by the fact that every time I go in for an appointment for the first two years, I was never called into the office to meet with him on time, not once, in two years, because he was on the phone with the IRS. A good CPA is not afraid of the IRS. A not-so-good CPA is going to file a return that they never, ever, ever have a return that would red flag to the IRS and they'd have to sit through an audit. They're safe. They're conservative. If that's your appetite, it's a good one for you. I went for the guy that was constantly on the phone with the IRS, not because they were questioning his ethics or his filing, but because he was going to bat for the client. It wasn't them calling him, it was him calling them. Okay? And brokers, same thing. I would be somebody that was not afraid of the market, somebody that was willing to just simply not look at a spec sheet that came from corporate headquarters in New York but rather somebody that was a little more independent and able to have more flexibility with the funds. If you go into some of these chain brokers, these chain store storefronts, they literally are working off of a spec sheet, a recommend sheet, and there isn't a whole lot of say. There isn't a whole lot of their own insight going into the recommendation because they have simply just, it's sort of like following a <coughs> liturgy that comes from Synod headquarters. It's not much different. Here's your scripture reading. These are your hymns. This is what you'll preach on. Give them the benediction and send them home to lunch. You want somebody that can give you some insight. You want some latitude in where your money goes. And you want to be able to enjoy this. It should be fun for you. It should not cause panic. It should not keep you awake at night. But this should be enjoyable and fun. It's 9 o'clock. I can have two more minutes. I'm allowed. I need to, I guess at this point, say what about questions? Anything closing? There are so many. 
Yeah, about that. <laughs> We're out of time. There are so many instruments that you can get into. Um, there's even one called an E, E something A. And it's actually an insured mutual fund that you can get into. And I would have to email out or email Tommy what it is. But it's the one that uh, I know some evangelists that are in these. You put in your principal, and there's a base level of what you invest, and you can contribute to it monthly. But it's insured up to $500,000 that if the, the market were to tank and you never allow it to go over that insured threshold, you're guaranteed to get your anniversary date balance back in your pocket regardless of what the market does. Can you think of the name of it? No. Yeah, it's an, it's an acronym. It's an initial. So as far as mutual fund, ETFs, and the other devices that you can be investing in, we're out of time. See a broker. <laughs> Find your risk appetite. I appreciate mutual funds. I really do. Your money takes, comes out automatically. It goes into the agency. The money is invested. And you can get historicals on the funds as to how they've performed over the past two to three years. And most mutual funds that are well managed, you're insulated by the billions of dollars they manage. They're doing huge buys and huge sells. That some of these mutual funds, when they move a big hold on a stock, they actually move the market. There is so much money that moves in their trade that it will affect the points of the market. And some of them are pretty drastic. They're pretty violent the way that they move. Um, and it's fun to watch. It's, trading is how I got my start. I was trading commodities in the Forex and the New York Stock Exchange. It's how I got my start. It's where I found my passion in finance. If I had more time, I could tell you testimonies about it. Um, yeah, I know I see them. If I may, just please leave it at that. To go and see your broker, to go and have a long conversation in prayer as to what your options are and what your risk appetite is, at what age do you want to start receiving principal payments off of the retirement fund for retirement for your own lifestyle? Set that all out with a broker and then make your move as to what you want to do. Okay? That would be my advice for everybody in the room. Yes? Um, I would like to have a way to find out what you, talk, what you were just trying to tell her and remember. But I wanted to ask you 702J's uh, accounts. 702J. J. This is a, yeah, it's investment bank account. Okay, that's a new one to me. I really? don't have an answer for you. Okay. A 702J, can you give me any information on that? It's, it's like, a, it's kind like of... a personal insurance account. It's a bank account, but it's like you... So did you go back into you insurance to... or are you still on investments? It's, it is an investment that allows you to insure yourself rather than having... I've heard insurance. of self-insured, but I've only yeah. ever heard of self-insured not by a number. Oh, self-insurance okay. is a big deal. It was created Corporation by... Corporations self-insure themselves. promoted by President Reagan. Okay. So it's been... No, you got me on that one. I don't know anything about that. So, okay. I told you I was willing to say I don't know. Oh yeah, you did. He's only half our age. So, all right. That's it.